Hi friends! In today's video I'm going to be talking about the books that I read in the first half of August. I feel like this summer has just been flying by. We're already halfway through the month of August, which is a little terrifying. <laughs> I've been reading a lot, but I still have so much more that I need to read. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about the majority of the books that I read in the first half of the month. I am going to tell you a good number of books that I read I can't talk about yet because I read them for reading vlogs. I currently have two secret TBR reading vlogs in progress. So in the first half of August, I've read 18 things eight of those are for those secret TBR vlog projects. So I'm not going to be talking about them in this video. I will be talking about the other 10 things that I've read. This is a somewhat unusually high number. However, it does include a novella, a poetry collection, a graphic novel. So I've got some shorter works in here. If you're new to my mid-month wrap-ups, the way that I do this is I talk about the books that I read in chronological order. At the end of the month, I do a wrap-up with stats and talking about books from lowest rated to highest rated. But for this video, I'm just going to tell you about them in the order that I read them. One thing I will say about my reading this month is it's been less fun than previous months. I feel like I've read some books that I didn't like very much. I've read quite a lot of books that were good but not amazing. And then the books that I've read that I have really loved have been about very heavy topics. And I don't think I'm going to be talking about either of those books <laughs> in this video because they're for a vlog project that I'm doing. But I, I think that's made it a little bit challenging that my favorite books of the month have been very heavy topically and a little difficult to read. So it, it's been an interesting experience. The first couple books I have to talk about are romances and both of these I had as audio review copies from NetGalley so I listened to them via audio and both of them were books that I think are pretty good even though I didn't necessarily love them. The first one was Sweet Tea by Piper Hughley. I had never read anything by Piper Hughley before and so when I saw this come available on audio I wanted to give it a try. I know her as one of the few black romance authors who write historical romance and I know she writes more on the inspirational side. This was her first contemporary romance that she wrote for Hallmark and it definitely reads like a Hallmark movie. I mean that that was what the experience was like with this audiobook. It's like a sweet Hallmark movie. I'm sure they're probably going to adapt it. It's like literally written for that. It follows a black woman from the south who has left her small town family home to go to the north. She lives in New York City and has just become a partner at a fancy law firm. She makes a lot of money and also has to combat microaggressions because of her race and gender in her chosen field. But you know, because this is the way these things go, she's maybe lost her way from her roots. Her grandmother still lives in a small town in the south and is renowned for her cooking ability, which is something that our heroine didn't want anything to do with. On the flip side, we have the hero who is a white man who is the son of a famous civil rights lawyer and his dad wanted him to follow in his footsteps, but he did not want to do that. And so he went to culinary school and has now befriended our heroine's grandmother because he's trying to make a documentary film about the treasures of these older women cooks from the South. But the heroine is worried that he's trying to take advantage of her grandmother and so she goes down to put a stop to whatever he's doing, weaseling his way into her life. And of course, a relationship develops. Overall, I liked this. Again, it's very much like a Hallmark movie. You can kind of expect something similar. Piper Hughley doesn't do steamy books, so there's some kissing, but that's about it. And there's also a religious undercurrent to this, which you might like or you might not like, but I do think that it's done in a way that is, uh, like, I think better than what a lot of the white inspirational romance authors who do religious themes do. So just throw that out there. And I really liked our heroine a lot. Honestly, <laughs> the thing that brought it down for me, and I can't figure out how much of this was the narrator and how much of this was the text, because I didn't have a physical text. I had this as an audiobook from, from NetGalley. Um, 
but I <laughs> I found the hero very irritating. It's probably both. The heroine found him irritating too, but then kind of was into him. And I don't know if it's just me, but I wanted to feel more of the chemistry between them. I mostly felt irritated on her behalf towards him because he would just like, he, he never got mad about stuff. He would just be super casual and chill in the way he would respond to things. But she would have like these very valid concerns and questions and he would just kind of be like, oh, I'm gonna casually talk around your concern. And like, I don't know why you're so worried about this. <laughs> and I'm like, I hate this so much. So I think the hero was less my cup of tea. But overall, I liked it. I would read more from her in the future. And I gave this book three and a half stars. Then another audio review copy from NetGalley that I listened to was The Dating Playbook by Farrah Rashone. This is the second book in a series that started with The Boyfriend Project, which I read last year and really loved. This follows another one of the three women who met up in book one. I think this one, whether you're going to like it, is just going to kind of depend on your taste. The thing about it is that this is a sports romance because the hero is a former NFL football player who got out of the game because of an injury and he's hiring our heroine, who's a personal trainer, to help get him ready to get back into the game. So sports romance is less my thing. And then the other piece of this is because she's a personal trainer and because of the setup of the story, there is a lot of on page discussion of like calories and things you should eat and things you shouldn't eat and like working out and all this stuff, which makes sense for the characters. But I just don't prefer to read that in my romance. So you know, just be aware there is quite a bit of that in the book. If that doesn't bother you and the premise setup sounds good, I think it's a pretty well done story. I liked their vibe. There's a little bit of a like secret relationship element. I think she does a decent job of trying to handle power dynamics because technically he's employing her and there's discussion of how that can be a problem and nothing really totally happens until they're no longer working together technically. So I think that's handled pretty well. The other thing that I really liked about it is that our heroine has ADHD and dyslexia and it talks about adults getting diagnosed later in life because for her it was really missed when she was in school. She always thought she just wasn't smart or wasn't capable and had like not gone to college and stuff and so I liked the way that this handled that whole scenario. So there were definitely things I liked about it, some other things that I didn't love quite as much and again I gave this one three and a half stars. Then I read a novella that had been recommended to me by somebody participating in the Robin Hobb read-along thing that I'm doing. This is The Willful Princess and the Piebald Prince by Robin Hobb. If you're reading the Farseer trilogy, I definitely think this is a novella worth picking up. It's really interesting and it gives a lot of context to the history of the wit and why it's something so hated and feared in the time of Fitz. I thought this was really good and really fascinating. It's kind of a two-part story. In some ways it feels like there's two pieces to it. It's all told from the perspective of this woman who was kind of a companion and ladies maid, I guess you could say, to this princess. And I'm not going to get into the details of what happens, but I thought this was a very, very interesting book. It's complicated. I mean, if you've read Robin Hobb stuff, like you know that things get messy and people make bad choices and like people get hurt. And the same is certainly true in this story. But I think what's interesting about it is that there's a queer relationship in the story where our narrator clearly is in love with the princess. And it's discussed on page that they had had like a physical relationship with each other. And so when the princess falls in love with a man and takes him as a lover, our narrator is really hurt by that. I just thought it was really, it was really interesting. I liked it a lot. I gave it five stars. And if you're reading that series and that sounds of interest to you, I would definitely recommend checking it out. Then I read the graphic novel of Legend by Marie Lu. I read this entire trilogy years ago, but because the Patreon book club pick this month is Rebel, which is like the fourth kind of standalone book that takes place 10 years after the events of the series, I wanted to kind of refresh my memory on the characters and the world and like what happened. I didn't have time to do a full reread of the series, but I thought, well, I have this first graphic novel sitting on my shelves. This seems like a good time to read it. So I read this and I liked it. I enjoyed it. I really like Marie Lu. I like her writing. I do think 
this is probably better to pick up as a refresher on the series. Um, there's definitely a lot of nuance that you miss with the graphic novel version versus the book. Like I don't know that this fully stands alone as a really solid property. Like I would probably more recommend reading the book and using this as a way of like refreshing your memory or maybe getting into the world for the first time before you read the books. I don't know. I mean, it's still pretty good. I enjoyed it. I gave it four stars, but I can see why there are some critiques of it. Um, but yeah, this was good. And it helped me kind of remember like, oh, yeah, that was kind of what was going on. And remember what happened later in the series. So I'm glad I read it. Then I read a book that I actually talk about more in a recent video where I talk about disability and neurodivergence in books. This is Real by Carol Kujak and Peyton Goddard. This is a book that was sent to me for review from Shadow Mountain Publishing. And I talk about it more at length in that video and also give recommendations of creators, authors, and books to read if you want to diversify your reading in those areas. It's a middle grade novel based on the real life experiences of one of the authors, Peyton Goddard. It follows a 13 year old girl who is autistic, nonverbal, and often doesn't have control of the movements of her body. For that reason, experts had always thought she was also severely mentally disabled, but as it turns out, she is not. And so in this book, we're in her head and she's funny and vibrant and interesting. And it kind of goes through her experiences of frustration of not being able to get her point across or be understood or have people know that she's learning and understanding stuff. She has amazing parents who love her and believe in her and advocate for her. But she also when the book starts is going to an institution where there is abuse taking place. And once her mom finds out what's happening, she takes her out and is very angry about it. But it deals with that. I do think it does it in an age appropriate way. This is written for a middle grade audience. I think you could give this to like an eight or nine year old and it would be fairly appropriate for them in the way that it handles it. But I just love this so much. I love the way that it breaks down assumptions that people might have. And eventually what happens is she gets the opportunity to try supported typing and is able to finally find her voice, which is not a thing I had known about. The author Peyton Goddard was in a similar situation and she was in her 20s before this happened and then became the first person to graduate college valedictorian using supported typing, which is really amazing. So anyway, I just thought this was a really wonderful and beautiful story. I loved it a lot. I gave it five stars and I think it's worth checking out. If you want to hear more, go watch that other video. Then I read a book that I did not like very much and I will talk a little bit about why here, but if you want to hear me and my friend Leanna at Leanna's Library talk more at length about this book and the series it's part of. We're going to be doing a live show on her channel on the 20th, um, which is a Friday evening. So I'll have her channel linked down below if you want to follow it. Uh, the book that I'm talking about is The Drawing of the Three by Stephen King. We read The Gunslinger together and we read this and um, we, we have a, a lot to say. So we're going to do a live show <laughs> just discussing them. So I read The Gunslinger last month. I didn't like it that much, but I had heard from a lot of people that the series really gets going in the drawing in the three. And I think conceptually, the series has a lot of really interesting ideas. And so I was like, yeah, okay, I want to give this a try and see how I get on with it. I, I know a lot of people love the series. I Okay, like, and this is why we're doing a live show. There are, there's a lot of layers to this. So one layer of this is I just didn't enjoy my experience of reading this. It wasn't enjoyable for me. And I think for some people, this book is more enjoyable. And if that's the case, that's cool. Um, for me, it just, it wasn't. There were things that I was less interested in and didn't care about. There were things that I just found distasteful to read about and it, like it's not fun for me. Um, yeah, so that's one piece of it. The other piece of this though is uh, he, there, there are choices made in this book that I think are worth talking about. It is the case that you can recognize something as being problematic and still love that thing. But I think it's important to recognize the problematic elements of it. And so I think for people who love the Dark Tower series, there are some things worth grappling with. 
I had a few different issues with this book, but I'm going to talk about the primary one, which is that in this book we're introduced to a black woman character. And oh my god, there's like layers to the problems with how this was handled. And I'm going to say up front, I think Stephen King had like was well intentioned. Like, I think he thought he was saying something deep about racism, um, but ended up playing into really harmful stereotypes instead. And there are some interesting articles of people discussing the fact that he has a history of doing things like this, of doing things like having the magical negro trope where you have a black character with something magical about them that solely exists to support and prop up white characters. That is a thing that happens in a lot of his books. Or just generally things that are not great representation of black people. So in this case, we have a black woman who we meet who has two personalities. And like problem one, <laughs> problem one is that in the text she is called schizophrenic, which is inaccurate. She has multiple personality disorder, which is not the same thing. Um, so so there's that. But then these two personalities, right? One of them is <laughs> God, I just reading this, I was like, what am what 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 am I reading? So one of the personalities is this elite, wealthy, feminine, sweet woman who is an advocate for civil rights because the way this world works is that she lives in America in like the 1950s or 60s is kind of how this is set up. So she's this like nice sweet woman. Her other personality is poor and violent and hypersexualized and talks in what's even recognized in the text as a like really extreme <laughs> stereotype of black people talking sort of um and you know it being Stephen King he gets pretty detailed about the the hypersexuality stuff and it's kind of disturbing. And the way that this plays out is that apparently this started with trauma. I'm not going to go into like spoilery details here, but this was caused by trauma, which I guess the subtext of this is that her experience of trauma caused her to split off this natural part of her personality because that that I I don't know. So here's the thing. Historically, and still today, black women have been portrayed as aggressive, violent, and hypersexual. It's a really harmful stereotype. And this book is like leaning hard into that stereotype in a way that I think is kind of messed up. The other thing about this, if you are thinking of reading it, um, or listening to the audiobook is I lost count of the number of times the n word was used in this book. It's a lot like a lot with the hard R at the end. Um, so choices were made. <laughs> and the thing is that I know a lot of people on booktube love the series, love Stephen King, and I don't hear people really talking about this. And if you enjoy the concept of the series, because I conceptually, I think it's an interesting idea. I just don't enjoy the process of reading all the stuff he decides to put on the page enough to want to continue. But if you enjoy the, the idea, if you enjoy the reading experience, cool, that's fine. Um, but we really should also be talking in more nuanced ways about the problems with the way that people of color are being represented, um, the way women are almost always hypersexualized, just to an even worse degree with this black female character. There's, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot. So I didn't like this. I gave this one and a half stars. Uh, and I will not be continuing on with the series. If you want to hear more in depth discussion between me and Leanna, join us on Friday. Okay, Whew, that was a long one. Um, what else? Then I read For the Wolf by Hannah Witten. This is a really interesting book. It was sent to me for a review from the folks over at Orbit. So thank you so much to them. I was very, very intrigued. This was pitched as a dark Red Riding Hood retelling, like fantasy 
thing, which I'm always here for. Uh, I would say this actually has a lot more in common with Beauty and the Beast than it does with Red Riding Hood. I have mixed feelings about this book and it is a debut novel so I'd be curious to see what we get from this author like a couple books down the road because there are things that I liked about it. It's got a super dark and creepy forest, it's got some interesting characters and setup. It's set in a world where because of a magical agreement in the past the second daughter of the royal family whenever there's two daughters is to be sent to this creepy magical wood. She belongs to the wolf who is believed to be like a monster that lives in the wood and the first daughter becomes queen. So this book is following two sisters who are twins. The older one is for the throne and the younger one is for the wolf. And so she goes off to the woods. There's magically things and creepy conspiracy different things there. But also everything is not what she expected it to be. And like I said, it's got a lot more in common with a Beauty and the Beast retelling, which I think is really interesting. So there was a lot that I liked about this. However, oh boy, this book was very long and it really, really dragged through the middle. It got very repetitive. I was really into it at the beginning. I was fully invested all the way up through when she goes into the woods and meets the wolf and kind of gets settled there. And then everything just got kind of boring and repetitive. I also wanted more chemistry in the romance if we're going to have that much of a romance focus. I just feel like it was kind of lacking in actual chemistry between the characters. So I wanted a little bit more from that. And I liked the ending. The ending things kind of sped up and was really interesting. But I wish that this book was either shorter or because I think it's going to be a duology that it had been condensed into one book. So there are things I like about it. I like the plot. I like the atmosphere, the characters, the ideas. Um, but the pacing was not the best and the chemistry between these two characters for the romance was not the best. I ended up giving this one three stars. Okay, so then um, I have a poetry collection and there's a story behind this. It's kind of interesting. I'm not a big poetry reader, but I went to my P.O. box and had a package with this little poetry collection and a very entertaining letter in it. And frequently, if I get things that were unsolicited in my P.O. box, I won't talk about them or read them. But in this case, I was intrigued and I thought the letter was very entertaining and I appreciate the hustle. So I decided <laughs> decided to give this book a try. Uh, this is Beautiful Bullshit, Weird Poems from a Thoughtful Brooklynite by Ohaini, 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 I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but um, Ohaini Porter. And this is a self-published poetry collection from a college student. And uh, it's an interesting one. So I will say this, it definitely could use some polish it could use a copy editor. And there are some pieces in here that really feel like filler or are just like bizarre, not in a good way. That said, I did really enjoy some of the poems. There were some things that made me laugh, like <laughs> the sense of humor behind some of the more humorous pieces. I really got a kick out of it made me laugh out loud a few times. And then there are some more serious pieces that are talking about things like being a young black man and identity and dealing with difficulties at home, etc. So you know, it was a very quick read. I mean, like, it, it's not long at all, which is why <laughs> which is why I went ahead and read it. But um, while this is certainly not perfect and not polished, I think there's something here. And I hope the author will continue writing and good on him for kind of shooting a shot. And uh, if you guys are interested, you can check it out. I gave this collection three stars because I enjoyed myself with parts of it. So um, yeah, also the letter was really funny. Great sense of humor. Um, <laughs> I will leave you with this piece. It's it's a little dumb, but it also made me laugh. Uh, so there's a list of things you will find in the poetry collection. And one of them says, see why every flat earther will cry. Page 48. The globe is round. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, not a great representation of some of the more serious pieces in here. But if you're interested, it's linked down below. And uh, 
yeah, it was fun. Okay, two more things to talk about. Both of them I had for review. One was an e-arc that I had from Neck Alley. This is The Sisters of Reckoning by Charlotte Nicole Davis. This is the second book in a duology that started with The Good Luck Girls, which I read a couple years ago and loved. I was highly anticipating this because I really, really loved the first book. And, uh, and it, this one was not as good. I'm gonna be honest. I feel like there were a couple of reasons that I didn't enjoy this as much. One thing was that our main character, the only perspective character that we get in this book is Aster, who you will know if you've read the first, the first books. And in this book, over and over and over again, she makes very rash, kind of dumb decisions without considering the consequences. And she never really learns and grows from that. Things just happen to work out more in her favor than not. Like things go wrong, but yeah. So that kind of bothered me. I wish that instead we'd seen an arc of character growth for her. So, so that was one piece of it. The other thing about this is this is a very ambitious book in terms of the amount of plot it's trying to get done. And because of that, I feel like it kind of squeezes out breathing room for the characters. There's a really large cast of characters in here, but we get hardly any page time with any of them, which is unfortunate because there's a lot of potentially great characters. This also was a book that had some interesting conversations about important things that I thought it dealt with pretty well. Stuff like the way that trauma can sometimes affect your experiences of sexuality and gender expression. We have a new character brought on the scene who is a trans woman and I really liked her. I thought she was really interesting. There was a lot of like pieces that I liked, but we didn't get enough of them. Everything moved too quickly, but also it was super plot driven and had plot points that felt repetitive. So what you ended up with is this book that was trying to do some good things, but didn't leave enough room for the characters to really breathe or grow or have a lot of page time. But then the plot itself was like cramming a lot into a small space while having some of those things feel repetitive. So uh, yeah, it wasn't the best. I did really like the ending. I thought the ending was really good. It was a really satisfying conclusion to the duology and I enjoyed that piece of it. But yeah, this one was unfortunately a little bit of a mixed bag for me and I gave it three stars. Lastly, I read a novella that I thought was fantastic. This is A Spindle Splintered by Alex E. Harrow. This was sent to me for review by the folks over at Tor.com and it is coming out in October. I really liked this a lot. It wasn't what I was expecting. I didn't read much of the back of the book before getting into it, which is part of why I just knew that it was a Sleeping Beauty retelling. What I didn't know, which I think is really interesting, is it's Sleeping Beauty meets the multiverse and it's like a feminist take on the fairy tale, but also taking into account the many different iterations of the fairy tale that have existed throughout the past, even some of the more horrifying and gruesome ones from early on. And it's a really interesting little novella. I liked it quite a lot. Our main character is a young woman with a terminal chronic illness she's been living with since she was a child. It's her 21st birthday and she's been told she has weeks left to live. She's always been a huge fan of Sleeping Beauty and has a degree in mythology and folklore. And her best friend throws her a Sleeping Beauty themed birthday party complete with a spindle, but when she pricks her finger, it sends her into another world with another Sleeping Beauty type. And it ends up becoming this sort of multiverse effect of like all of these different Sleeping Beauty type stories. And it's really, really interesting. I really enjoyed the sense of humor and the places where it kind of breaks the fourth wall a little bit. And a lot of what this book is doing is pushing back on these norms of female subjugation and passivity, of assumed heteronormativity. We've got queer characters in the story that it, that are handled in really interesting ways, and also about the value of sisterhood and women fighting for each other. I really loved it a lot. I thought it was great. One thing that I think is really interesting, and I was curious to see how it was going to handle it, is that because our character has this terminal chronic illness, I was like, okay, is this going to fall into that trope that I know can be really problematic of having like a magical cure? Um, and I was curious to see like what this did with that. I don't want to spoil 
what happens, but I really liked the choice that Alex D. Hara made at the end. I'm curious to see what other people think, but I really liked it. I thought it was a very interesting way of, I don't know, like almost deconstructing that trope. And yeah, so I would go check it out. It comes out in October. It's great. It's also got all these like really cool illustrations. It was very enjoyable. Thank you, Tor. There you go. Those are the 10 books that I read in the first half of the month that I can tell you about. Keep an eye out for these reading vlogs coming later in the month as we go. I'm working on two of them and you'll hear my thoughts on more books eventually. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for question of the day, you know what? Let's talk about this. Let's talk about problematic faves. Books that you love but also recognize maybe have some issues with them. I did not love The Drawing of the Three, but I know there are a lot of people who do love this series. And so I think it's interesting to consider what are the things that we love, because I have my own, Every, I think everybody does, right? Like we all have our, we all have our books that we love and we recognize they have issues, but we love them anyway. Um, and so tell me about one of yours and how do you kind of grapple with that dissonance of like holding those things in tension with each other? Talk to me about it in the comments down below. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time.